Good morning. My name is Alicia Harrison. Thank you for having me here today. I think this is a really exciting opportunity for us to be together and learn from one another. So I don't know about you guys, but I have, <clears throat> my sense was that this patient was one of the most troubling one to see in my, in my office. I felt that I just had so little to offer them for a long time. Um, and I felt like this was one of the most difficult problems in shoulder surgery. To have a young, active patient who has an irreparable cuff tear. These are patients who are struggling with pain and dysfunction, and many of them have very high expectations. And uh, my sense was that I just had so little uh, to offer them uh, in terms of being able to provide them promising outcomes or reliable outcomes. So as you know, we can debride uh, or address the biceps pathology or even attempt a partial repair for these patients. But oftentimes in those settings, the pain relief from that procedure is not very predictable and certainly improved function is perhaps less likely. So perhaps tendon transfers would help them. I've done tendon transfers, and unfortunately, like uh, many colleagues, I just have not felt that those outcomes were as reliable. And certainly for that active younger patient, it's a pretty big exposure and incision uh, to place on somebody. And I just didn't feel like my results with that procedure were as consistent as I'd like them to be. And then certainly the reverse total shoulder. So for a young active patient, this isn't a really very palatable option uh, for them. Uh, they're much too active uh, to be satisfied by that, and they may not have arthrosis. So I think a lot of us struggled with this, and uh, Dr. Mihata developed the reproduction of the superior capsule uh, of the glenohumeral joint with originally introduction of fasciolata autograft and then uh, <coughs> subsequently using dermal al allograft. So the indications for SCR, uh, I think, are most are pretty consistent about this. These are active patients with a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear involving the supraspinatus and often infraspinatus. They have minimal or no glenohumeral arthritis, so hematograde one or two, uh, as you can see those images there. They have a functional deltoid and trapezius, and they have an intact or at least repairable subscap. So from a technique standpoint, once you've uh, recognized or identified and confirmed that they have truly an irreparable tear, you would prepare and uh, debride the anchor sites on the superior glenoid and then uh, greater tuberosity. And uh, the knotless options, the 3 suture tack or 3-9 corkscrews, uh, have really been a nice uh, addition to this technique. Uh, it, placement of these is important. So at about 11 o'clock, 12.30, and 3 o'clock for the left shoulder, as you can see there, you essentially rotate those anchor placements uh, posterior a bit. And then laterally preparing your graded tuberosity as you would for, um, for a rotator cuff repair, uh, similarly to uh, what Dr. Frank showed uh, for a double row. So preparing for a speed bridge or expanded speed bridge. And then measurements, these are really important. And this tool has been, uh, uh, as the guys I work with know, this tool has been really helpful uh, to accurately measure and more easily measure uh, during the procedure between those anchors. So measuring between each of those medial uh, row glenoid anchors and then between the anterior medial and anterior lateral anchors and then posterior medial and posterior lateral anchors and then between the lateral anchors themselves. Uh, and so this is a really nice way to do that. And importantly, the arm is positioned in 30 degrees of abduction when you are taking those measurements, and that's critical. So then taking those measurements to the back table and marking where those uh, anchor sites and suture passing locations are going to be in the graft, and then adding about a centimeter beyond that anchor measurement, particularly laterally. So next comes loading all of those sutures through your graft. Using a 12 millimeter cannula, uh, passport cannula is uh, recommended. Some people split it uh, and others don't. Um, I think it can be done both ways. And then you would pass your fiber tape through the lateral prepared uh, sites in the graft. And then you pass your knotless sutures in mattress configuration and then load those uh, through the shuttle loop. So then the other limb of those medial glenoid anchors are coming out of each of their respective uh, portal or uh, entry sites. And then you can take that uh, suture from each of those knotless uh, medial glenoid anchors and you tension those and deliver the graft into the glenoid. And this is where I think the, the knotless anchors really have uh, improved things for me because it eliminates some of the suture strands in the cannula and you have much less trouble uh, trying to keep those straight and prevent them from holding up the graft or just having more uh, mass in the cannula. And then once you've docked your uh, graft uh, on the glenoid, you, as you can see in the bottom right picture, um, the 
graft approximates to that site, and then you complete your speed bridge laterally, taking your fiber tape or tiger tape and, and putting in that lateral row. So you may think then you're done, everything looks great, and you can move on, right? Not so fast. These margin convergence sutures are critical, and Dr. Mahata has studied the biomechanics of this in the lab, and placing the posterior side-to-side uh, -side sutures significantly improved shoulder stability in the lab, such that that posterior superior subluxation no longer occurred. So the posterior margin convergence sutures are necessary. Perhaps the anterior lateral repair or anterior lateral margin convergence is recommended, but avoid the anterior medial uh, margin convergence that may overconstrain the construct. So now we're gaining some uh, early or midterm uh, results with some increasing numbers, and this is, this is helpful and promising. Uh, Dr. Pennington published on his 88 patients, 36 with two-year follow-up, and you can see there their range of motion at two years is promising. And we're gaining increasing publications. Dr. Adams and others published on some of the SOS data or in arth arthroscopy in, two the, in January this year. And they have 59 patients with one-year follow-up and uh, MRI outcomes as well. And the, this SOS data is really, as I said, promising and I think helpful for these patients. You can see that their SANE scores are improved, their ASCS function scores improve, and very importantly, their pain is, is decreasing. So, Entering into this uh, procedure, I had some caution, and I would say I'm pretty conservative in terms, of, in terms of indicating patients for this, but I think some of my patients' outcomes have been really um, exciting. And so this is a 57-year-old gentleman. He's a heavy machine operator in Minnesota, a good Minnesota large guy. Um, and his active forward elevation when he came to see me was 100 degrees. He had had an attempted cuff repair at an outside hospital. And they had determined at that point, not surprisingly, based on his MRI, that he did not have a repairable tear. So we found, as you can see on the upper left side, he had no cuff tissue to repair, put in his graft. And not that long ago, I saw him for his six-month follow-up. And I'm not really very good about taking pictures uh, in the office, but this patient struck me so much. And so I asked him if I could take his pictures. This is at six months. Uh, and he's just getting, he was getting back to work. Um, you know, he's modifying his activities. He's not lifting, you know, 200 pounds anymore, but he's, he's certainly doing heavy machine operating. And he reported his pain score at zero and his SANE score uh, on that side uh, was 85. And then this, this nice lady, she's 55 and this is her dominant arm. She's work comp, so I get a little bit worried about, about some of these patients, but she was really struggling. Um, she had, as you can see, significant atrophy of her supra and infra retracted, essentially irreparable tear and without arthritis. So we did an SCR for her. She, um, we advanced her in physical therapy and she had pretty, a pretty acute change in her pain. She'd had an event in PT. And um, so I was concerned about how she was doing. And so we actually took her back for a second look scope at four months post-op. And I was stunned when I put the scope in the shoulder and on the upper left and upper right pictures, you can see that she actually has healed, this is at four months, uh, graft to the tuberosity there, and then the middle and bottom left and bottom right images. You know, I'd heard that, you know, this graft vascularizes and that this can incorporate, and, and I didn't truly internally uh, in my gut know that it would happen until I, I saw this patient. So this was really reassuring. And she's getting her motion back and her pain is decreasing, and so this has really been exciting for me. But for those patients who are not as young or active, or maybe who don't have as much of a healthy biologic system, we still have an option for those patients. Because uh, I was struggling with those patients as well, and with the reverse, uh, we really can return uh, those patients with arthritis uh, who are maybe biologically older, but still need good pain relief. And the SOS outcomes on the reverse are really promising as well. Their VAS pain scores decrease, their SANE scores are uh, increasing significantly, and their ASCS uh, index scores are, are really impressive as well. So finally, for this patient with an irreparable tear, I think we have reasonable options for them. Um, an arthroscopic option for the younger active patient in the SCR that can decrease their pain and improve function and the reverse for those patients who fall outside SCR indications who are not maybe as uh, active or healthy and we can still decrease their pain and improve their function. Thank you very much.